Lissa Productions. Welcome back to Experimental Physics. This time we're going to explore driven oscillations and resonance. When you tune the frequency to just the right condition, the oscillations of the response of the system become quite large. So our assumptions are still uh, the same spring force obeying Hooke's law, uh, minus a constant times the displacement. The same damping force assumption that the force of the damping is proportional to the velocity. And now we're adding a third force into the mix, a variable frequency driving force that oscillates periodically. And you have complete control over the frequency of the driver. So put all three of those forces together according to Newton's second law, and the result is the mass times the acceleration. With all of those assumptions, we get a general solution to the uh, differential equation, which has two pieces to it. This part you'll recognize from last time. It's exactly the same form as the damped oscillations. If you wait long enough, this part of the solution goes away, just dies out exponentially. What remains and what we're going to investigate today is the steady state portion of the solution. So this is a, an oscillating piece that doesn't decay. It has an amplitude that depends on the frequency that you set. So we'll explore the details of this frequency dependent amplitude of the system, which looks like this. It's a, a horrendous looking uh, equation, but parts of it are intuitive. The response of the system depends directly on how strong the driving force is. So if you force it harder, you'll get a larger response. Sort of intuitive also is the inverse relationship with the mass. That's kind of a uh, Newton's first law uh, inertia thing. If there's more mass, it's harder to get the thing moving with the same force. The interesting part of the equation, though, is this frequency dependent denominator. So what we'll do is to tune the frequency of the driver closer and closer to the natural frequency, and the oscillations become quite large. Actually, with a little bit of damping in the system, the resonance occurs not exactly at the natural frequency, which is just the square root of the spring constant over the mass. It actually resonates at a slightly different frequency, but that's a subtle detail that we don't need to worry too much about. The main point is that the damping in the system will be rather small, and if that's the case, the system will resonate at a frequency that's pretty close to this natural frequency of oscillation. Now the shape of the response, which is the thing that you'll explore in detail in the laboratory, looks kind of like this. Um, it's not a Gaussian, as you might guess from the shape. It really isn't. It's a different physical form. But the important features are the resonance frequency. You get a maximum response at a particular frequency that depends on properties of the system. And the width of the response depends on the amount of damping. So some of the things that you might choose to explore in your measurements include what happens to the resonance frequency as you change the mass or the spring constant. It will shift up or down depending on how you adjust those properties of the system. You might want to explore what happens to the width of this curve as you change the amount of damping. So that's the basic idea. We're going to explore the resonance behavior as you tune the frequency of the driver. Where do you get the maximum response? And over what range of frequencies do you see the response? So all of the equipment is already familiar to you. And what we're going to do, if the apparatus isn't already set up for you when you come into the lab, we're going to take the mechanical driver that you use to calibrate the photogate timer and just pull out the flag from the top and then attach this to a ring stand and just clamp it here temporarily. Then you want to remove the end stop on the glider. Just take this off completely. and set that aside. And now lower the mechanical driver 
right down almost to the ridge of the track and you clip the spring right onto the driver. So there should be enough room under the track for the driver to push and pull the spring back and forth but not actually to rub against the top of the track. Now we've got the glider oscillating freely. I'd like to show you what happens when we set this thing into resonance. So I'm going to start not with the system that you're actually going to investigate in the lab, but with the system that has the four extra non-magnetic masses. And I'd just like to do a real quick measurement of the period of the system with the photo gate timer. So we've measured the period of oscillation of the system with the four springs and the four extra masses. This is roughly one and a quarter seconds. So if we do a quick mental calculation, one and a quarter is roughly five quarters. The reciprocal of that is four fifths. So uh, the frequency of oscillation is about 0 0.8 hertz. What I'd like to do is to stop the glider and then force the oscillations with this driving system and I'll tune the frequency to something in the neighborhood of 0.8 hertz and we'll see what the response of the system is. So let's turn on the function generator. And this is the good one, so it came on to one hertz, which is where we left it in uh, the free oscillations timer calibration part. So let me change the frequency to 0.8 hertz. And remember that you have to tell it the units, so 0.8 and then press the hertz button. And we'll just watch what happens to the system. Now I haven't touched the glider, it was just sitting there and all I did was to turn on the driver at a frequency which I roughly predicted to be the resonance frequency, the reciprocal of the natural period. And the response of the system is really quite large. Now if we watch this for a while, you might notice something very peculiar about the system. It's going to oscillate for a while and build up in amplitude but then, mysteriously, without touching it, the amplitude will start to decrease a little bit. It won't stay at that frequency. So what's going on there is the fighting of the damped, frequent, the damped solution against the steady state solution. So you want to wait a little bit for the damped part of the solution to die out before you try to make a measurement of what the oscillation is. But let's assume now that the damped part of the oscillation has in fact died out and all we have is the steady state solution. What you want to do is to estimate the amplitude of oscillation of the system. And you can do this any way you like. Uh, you can do it the old-fashioned way, just watch the corner of the glider and get an estimate of what the amplitude of oscillation is against the millimeter scale just by eye. Or if you want to be clever, you can use the video capture in your smartphone and just look frame by frame and watch and see when do you really get a maximum oscillation. That choice is up to you. But somehow you'd like to get an estimate of the amplitude of the oscillations. And now I've deliberately talked long enough that I think you can see the oscillations have died out a little bit. So this is the place at which you want to be very patient and, and wait for the transient to die out before you try to make a measurement. This system has essentially no damping, so you'll have to wait a really, really long time to get the steady state oscillations. With the damping in the system, it'll be a little bit easier uh, to do this. So, so the starting point should always be a rough estimate of where you think the resonance is going to occur. So you measure the period of oscillations and take the reciprocal of that. That will give you a real rough estimate of where the peak is going to occur.
Now, the system that we would really like you to begin to investigate is not this system that has essentially no damping. So I'm going to take off the non-magnetic masses and put back on two of these magnets. So place the magnets flat on the wings of the glider and then add a little more mass. So one non-magnetic mass on each side. And we've got the frequency set still at 0.8 hertz. So you want to wait a little bit for the transient to die out before you try to make a measurement. And once you are convinced that the transient has died out, then just estimate as well as you can what the amplitude of oscillations is. And you can do that in uh, either way that you choose, either by eye or, again, by using the video capture capability of your smartphone if you have that. That's entirely your choice. But you want to carefully measure what is the amplitude of oscillation of the system at each of the different frequencies. So we start at an estimate of the resonance, the reciprocal of the period, then change the frequency. So it's set at 0.8. We'll just make it uh, 0.81 hertz. And do remember to press the hertz button. Otherwise, the frequency won't change. It will still be 0.8. So you have to enter the, uh, the hertz as well as the number. So again, wait for the transient to die out before you take a measurement and then measure as carefully as you can what is the amplitude of oscillation for this new frequency. Then change the frequency again. What you're probably going to do is to explore in the neighborhood of the resonance at least at the level of a hundredth of a hertz and probably also at the level of a thousandth of a hertz in order to get enough good data to determine both the location of the resonance frequency and the width of this curve. So gather a lot of good data, lots of careful measurements, at least at the level of a hundredth of a hertz and then maybe near the peak get uh, data at the level of a thousandth of a hertz and find exactly what is the resonance frequency and what's the width of the curve. So that's uh, about it for the resonance measurements. So just to sum up, we are investigating the resonance response of a driven mass spring system with a little bit of damping. The idea is to get enough data to determine precisely what the shape of this curve is and where the resonance frequency is. That is to say, what is the maximum response? And depending on the instructor of the course, you might want to explore the width of this curve as you change the damping, or you might want to explore the position of this curve as you change the spring constant or the mass. But your instructor will tell you specifically what investigations to do.